Hello, hello. Welcome to Storytime with Moog. I am Moog. Today we are reading Star Maker by Olaf Stapleton, originally published in 1937. And we are starting with chapter 10, part two. <laughs> it was it was a long chapter last time, and we still have a long way to go in this chapter, so that's the plan for the day. Reading updates. I I don't think I have any. I don't think I have any. Oh, um, I finished. Just kidding. Yes, I do. I finished um, The Left Hand of Darkness. I don't know if I talked about it, but I did finish it. Um, I did really enjoy it. The f It's 252 pages, and the first, like, 150 pages is very much political and environmental and social setup, and then the last, like, 100 pages is, like, super action and like events are happening. Um, but you don't have that sort of appreciation without having the first 150 pages. Um, so if you can make it through that, or if that part just super interests you too, I guess there's, there's both intrigue for different types of readers. Um, and also, um, it's written by Ursula K. Le Guin and her writing style is just so good. It reads not so much like a science fiction, but more like a fantasy, just in like the style of writing, if that makes sense. Um, like it's not super into like science, math, like that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's enjoyable. Um, let's see. And I think I think that's all that I'm reading. Oh, I started, that's, that's another lie. I started Gideon the Ninth by Tasman. Oh man, I need to look up the name. Cause as soon as I started saying it, I was like, I should have, I should have looked it up first. And I do that every time. Have you ever done that where you start to like say something and then like mid sentence, you realize that you don't know how that sentence is going to end. Okay, Tasman Muir. I I don't know how to pronounce it. Um but it is the first in a series and it looks like there are three books that are out and a fourth one that has been announced. Um but it's called Gideon the Ninth and Gideon is a indentured servant to this ninth house and they're all necromancers except for Gideon. Gideon is really good with fighting, um, like with the sword and everything. And the daughter of the priestess, I think I'm saying this right. Apologies if I'm not. But the, da the daughter of the priestess is going to the first house to learn new skills and to like level up and that sort of thing. And while she's going there, she needs to have... Um, a cavalier with her. So the person who was chosen to be that person has left, like fled. And so now Gideon is that person. And I'm not super far into it. I think I'm on chapter four and they have just gotten to the first house and that's where I am so far. Um, it is a fantasy and you can definitely tell that it's a fantasy with the necromancers and stuff, but the the powers are really cool. Um, the daughter, her powers uh, focus a lot on skeletons. So she's able to reanimate skeletons. And also if there's like bone powder and stuff, she can make it into like a bone, which is really awesome and really cool in combat. We got to see her do a combat and like, that was just really cool. And I would love that power. Would it scare me? Absolutely. But I would also love it. <laughs> I feel like if I had that power, I would just, like, scatter bone fragments everywhere, um, so that, just in case, you know, you never know. You never know when you're gonna need a hand. Yeah, that was a bot. <laughs> but yes, okay, now I think that's all that I'm reading. Yeah, okay, cool. But today, we are reading Star Maker, uh, by Olaf Stapleton, and I... Or a foot, exactly. You never know. <laughs> um, we are starting with uh, chapter 10, the second part. 
so it's divided into parts. This chapter is really stinking long. Um, and what is happening now? Okay, so previously, our main character, we do not have a name for this person, has been traveling to other worlds and um, finding humanoid, human-like, homo sapien-like creatures on these different planets and just watching them evolve. Some of them he, um, were only there for like a couple days or weeks. Other times were there for many, many years. We can see like the progression of their evolution and each planet that we've visited has had a flaw that has like led to their downfall um, or a flaw that has like made things like a little bit more difficult than it needs to be. That sort of thing. And now we have gathered all of these different um, friends from the planets who also want to travel along with us. And now we're starting to make the like analysis and like similarities and differences among all of these different worlds instead of hyper focusing on like one but broadening it if that makes sense I think that makes sense I don't know we'll we'll see it is it is a little hard I know I've said this before but it is a little bit harder to do the like recaps in between just because there's so much commentary and it's not heavy plot based it's just like we looked at these you know humanoid creatures and they are a symbiotic you know species and this happened that sort of thing so you can really like narrow down like whole chapters into like one or two sentences by cutting out all the all the fun detail and fluff so with that being said get cozy get a snack have a little drink and let's do it. Chapter 10, part two. Intermundane strife. Of the busy utopias which I have been describing, a few were already established even before the birth of other Earth. A larger number flourished before our own planet was formed, but many of the most important of these worlds are temporally located in an age far future to us, an age long after the destruction of the final human race. Causalities among these awakened worlds are, of course, much less common than among more lowly and less competent worlds. Consequently, though fatal accidents occurred in every epoch, the number of awakened worlds in our galaxy steadily increased as time advanced. The actual births of planets, due to the cha chance encounters of mature but not aged stars, reached, or will reach, a maximum fairly late in the history of our galaxy, and then declined. But since the fluctuating progress of a world from bare anima animality to spiritual maturity takes, on the average, several thousands of millions of years, the maximum population of utopian and fully awakened worlds occurred very late, when physically the galaxy was already somewhat past its prime. Further, though even in early epochs, the few awakened worlds did sometimes succeed in making contact with one another. Either by interstellar travel or by telepathy, it was not till a fairly late stage of our galactic history that intermundane relations came to occupy the main attention of the wakened worlds. Throughout the progress of a waking world, there was one grave, subtle, and easily overlooked danger. Interest might be fixated upon some current plane of endeavor so that no further advance could occur. It may seem strange that beings whose psychological knowledge so far surpassed the attainment of man should have been trapped in this manner. Apparently, at every stage of mental development, save the highest of all, the mind's growing point is tender and easily misdirected. However this may be, it is a fact that a few rather highly developed worlds, even with communal mentality, were disastrously perverted in a strange manner 
which I find very difficult to understand. I can only suggest that in them, seemingly, the hunger for true community and true mental lucidity itself became obsessive and perverse, so that the behavior of these exalted perverts might deteriorate into something very like tribalism and religious fanaticism. The disease would soon lead to the stifling of all elements which seemed recalcitrant to the generally accepted culture of the world society. When such worlds mastered interstellar travel, they might conceive a fanatical desire to impose their own culture throughout the galaxy. Sometimes their zeal became so violent that they were actually driven to wage ruthless religious wars on all who resisted them. Obsessions derived from one stage or another of the progress toward utopia and lucid consciousness, even if they did not bring violent disaster, might at any stage sidetrack the waking world into futility. Superhuman intelligence, courage, and constancy on the part of the devoted individuals might be consecrated to misguided and unworthy world purposes. Thus it was that, in extreme cases, even a world that remained socially utopian and mentally a super-individual might pass beyond the bounds of sanity. With a gloriously healthy body and an in insane mind, it might do terrible harm to its neighbors. Such strategy did not become possible till after interplanetary and interstellar travel had been well established. Long ago, in an early phase of the galaxy, the number of planetary systems had been very small, and only half a dozen worlds had attained utopia. These were scattered up and down the galaxy at immense distances from one another. Each lived its life in almost complete isolation, relieved only by precarious telepathic intercourse with its peers. In a somewhat later but still early period, when these eldest children of the galaxy had perfected their society, and their biological nature, and were on the threshold of super-individuality, they turned their attention to interplanetary travel. First one, and then another, achieved rocket flight in space, and succeeded in breathing, breeding specialized populations for the colonization of neighboring planets. Okay, so, so far, this is a commonality that they have found in all of the planets is that once they have been established, they all eventually get to interstellar travel, which is kind of cool that they have all of these planets, though very, very different, have all come to this sort of curiosity, which is awesome. In a still later epoch, the middle period of galactic history, there were many more planetary systems than in the earlier ages, and an increasing number of intelligent worlds were successfully emerging from the great psychological crisis which so many worlds never surmount. Meanwhile, some of the elder generation of awakened worlds were already facing the immensely difficult problems of travel on the interstellar and not merely the interplanetary scale. This new power inevitably changed the whole character of galactic history. Hitherto, in spite of tentative telepathic exploration on the part of the most awakened worlds, the life of the galaxy had been in the main the life of a number of isolated worlds, which took no effect upon one another. With the advent of interstellar travel, the main distinct themes of the world biographies gradually became merged in all, in, in all embracing drama. Travel within a planetary system was at first carried out by rocket vessels propelled by normal fuels. In all the early ventures, one great difficulty had been the danger of collision with meteors. Even the most efficient vessel, most skillfully navigated and traveling in regions that were relatively free from these invisible and lethal missiles, might at any moment crash and fuse. The trouble was not overcome till means 
had been found to unlock the treasure of subatomic energy. It was then possible to protect the ship by means of a far-flung envelope of power, which either diverted or exploded the meteors at a distance. A rather similar method was with great difficulty devised to protect the spaceships and their crew from the constant and murderous hail of cosmic radiation. Interstellar, as opposed to interplanetary, travel was quite impossible until the advent of subatomic power. Fortunately, this source of power was seldom gained until late in the world's development, when mentality was mature enough to wield this most dangerous of all physical instruments without inevitable disaster. Disasters, however, did occur. Several worlds were accidentally blown to pieces, in other civilized civilization was temporarily destroyed. Sooner or later, however, most of the minded worlds tamed this formidable djinn and set it to work upon a titanic scale, not only in industry, but in such great enterprises as the alteration of planetary orbits for the improvement of climate. This dangerous and delicate process was affected by firing a gigantic subatomic rocket apparatus at such times and places that the recoil would gradually accumulate to divert the planet's course in the desired direction. Actual interstellar voyaging was first affected by detaching a planet from its natural orbit by a series of well-timed and well-placed rocket impl impulsions and thus projecting it into outer space at a speed far greater than the normal planetary and stellar of speeds. Something more than this was necessary, since life on a sunless planet would have been impossible. For short interstellar voyages, the difficulty was sometimes overcome by the generation of subatomic energy from the planet's own substance. But for longer voyages, lasting for many thousands of years, the only method was to form a small artificial sun and project it into space as a blazing satellite of the living world. For this purpose, an uninhabited planet would be brought in proximity with the home planet to form a binary system. A mechanism would then be contrived for the controlled disintegration of the atoms of the lifeless planet to provide a constant source of light and heat. The two bodies, revolving round one another, would be launched among the stars. This delicate operation may well seem impossible, had I space to describe the age-long experiments and world-wrecking accidents which preceded its achievement, perhaps the reader's incredulity would vanish. It is a really cool idea, and I keep thinking, like, this book seems so modern that i keep have to have to keep having to remind myself that it was written in 1937 which is just so wild but yeah like that's so cool to have these ideas and this like imagination almost i guess because like we were no mistaken you know it's just it's really cool it's fascinating This delicate operation may well seem impossible. Had I space to describe the age-long experiments and world-wrecking accidents which preceded its achievement, perhaps the reader's incredulity would vanish. But I must dismiss, in a few sentences, whole protracted epics of scientific adventure and personal courage. Suffice it that, before the process was perfected, Many a populous world was either cast adrift to freeze in space, or was roasted by its own artificial sun. The stars are so remote from one another that we measure their distances in light years. Had the voyaging worlds traveled only at speeds comparable with those of the stars themselves, even the shortest of interstellar voyages would have lasted for many millions of years. But since interstellar space offers almost no resistance to a traveling body, and therefore momentum is not lost, 
it was possible for the voyaging world, by prolonging the original rocket impulsion for many years, to increase its speed far beyond that of the fastest star. Indeed, though even the early voyages by heavy natural planets were by our standard spectacular, I shall have to tell at a later stage of voyages by small artificial planets traveling at almost half the speed of light, owing to certain relativity effects. It was impossible to accelerate beyond this point. But even such a rate of travel made voyages to the nearer stars well worth undertaking if any other planetary system happened to lie within its range. It must be remembered that a fully awakened world had no need to think in terms of such short periods as a human lifetime. Though its individuals might die, the minded world was in a very important sense immortal. It was accustomed to lay its plans to cover periods of many million years. In early epochs of the galaxy, expeditions from star to star were difficult and rarely successful. But at a later stage, when there were already many thousands of worlds inhabited by intelligent races, and hundreds that had passed the utopian stage, a very serious situation arose. Interstellar travel was by now extremely efficient. Immense exploration vessels, many miles in diameter, were constructed out in space from artificial materials of extreme rigidity and lightness. These could be projected by rocket action and with cumulative acceleration till their speed was almost half the speed of light. Even so, the journey from end to end of the galaxy could not be completed under 200,000 years. However, there was no reason to undertake so long a voyage. Few voyages in search of suitable systems lasted for more than a tenth of that time. Many were much shorter. Races that had attained and secured a communal consciousness would not hesitate to send out a number of such expeditions. Ultimately, they might project their planet itself across the ocean of space to settle in some remote system recommended by the pioneers. The problem of interstellar travel was so enthralling that it sometimes became an ex um, in obsession even to a fairly well-developed utopian world. This could only occur if the constitution of that world there was something unwholesome, some secret and unfulfilled hunger impelling the beings. The race might then become travel-mad. Its social organization would be refashioned and directed with Spartan strictness to the new communal undertaking. All its members, hypnotized by the common obsession, would gradually forget the life of intense personal intercourse and of creative mental activity which had hitherto been their chief concern. The whole venture of the spirit, exploring the universe and its own nature with critical intelligence and delicate sensibility, would gradually come to a standstill. The deepest roots of emotion and will which in the fully sense, in the fully sane, awakened world were securely within the range of introspection, would become increasingly obscured. Less and less in such a world could the unhappy communal mind understand itself. More and more it pursued its phantom goal. Any attempt to explore the galaxy telepathically was now abandoned. The passion of physical exploration assumed the guise of a religion. The communal mind persuaded itself that it must at all costs spread the gospel of its own culture throughout the galaxy. The culture itself was vanishing. The vague idea of culture was cherished as a justification of world policy. Here, I must check myself, lest I give false impression. It is necessary to distinguish sharply between the mad worlds of comparatively low mental development and those of almost the highest order. The humbler kinds might become crudely obsessed by sheer mastery 
or sheer travel with its scope for courage and discipline. More tragic was the case of those few very much more awakened worlds whose obsession was seemingly for community itself and mental lucidity itself and the propagation of the kind of community and the special mode of lucidity most admired by themselves. For them, travel was but the means to cultural and religious empire. I've spoken as though I were confident that these formidable worlds were indeed mad, apparent from the line of mental and spiritual growth, but their tragedy lay in the fact that, though to their opponents they seemed to be either mad or at heart wicked, to themselves they appeared superbly sane, practical, and virtuous. There were times when we ourselves, the bewildered explorers, were almost persuaded that this was the truth. Our intimate contact with them was such as to give us insight, so to speak, into the inner sanity of their insanity, or the core of righteousness in their wickedness. This insanity or wickedness I have to describe in terms of simple human craziness and vice, but in truth, it was in a sense superhuman, for it included the perversion of faculties above the range of human sanity and virtue. When one of these mad worlds encountered a sane world, it would sincerely express the most reasonable and kindly intentions. It, des it desired only cultural intercourse, and perhaps economic cooperation. Little by little it would earn the respect of the other for its sympathy, its splendid social order, and its dynamic purpose. Each world would regard the other as a noble, though perhaps an alien and partly incomprehensible instrument of the spirit. But little by little, the normal world would begin to realize that in the culture of the mad world, there were certain subtle and far-reaching intuitions that appeared utterly false, ruthless, aggressive, and hostile to the spirit, and were the dominant motives of its or of its foreign relations. The mad world, meanwhile, would regretfully come to the conclusion that the other was, after all gravely lacking in sensibility, that it was obtuse to the very highest values and most heroic virtues, in fact, that its whole life was subtly corrupt and most, for its own sake, be changed or else destroyed. Thus each world, though with lingering respect and affection, would sadly condemn the other, but the mad world would not be content to leave matters thus. It would at length with holy fervor attack striving to destroy the other's pernicious culture, and even exterminate its population. Thank you so much for the hydrate. It's just water today, I know. I didn't have time to make anything fun. It's just water. But it looks like I'm having something nice and toasty, right? I've, I've hidden it. <laughs> Thank you so much for the hydrate. Okay, one more sip. Okay. It is easy for me now, after the event, after the final spiritual downfall of these mad worlds, to condemn them as perverts. But in the early stages of their drama, we were often desperately at a loss to decide on which side sanity lie. Several of the mad worlds succumbed to their own foolhardiness hardiness in navigation. Others, under the strain of age-long research, fell into social neurosis and civil strife. A few, however, succeeded in attaining their end, and after voyages lasting for thousands of years, were able to reach some neighboring planetary system. The invaders were often in a desperate plight. Generally, they had used up most of the material of their little artificial sun. 
economy had forced them to reduce their ration of heat and light so far that when at last they discovered a suitable planetary system, their native world was almost wholly arctic. On arrival, they would first take up their position in a suitable orbit, and perhaps spend some centuries in recuperating. Then they would explore the neighboring worlds, seek out the most hospitable, and begin to adapt themselves or their descendants to life upon it. If, as was often the case, any of the planets was already inhabited by intelligent beings, the invaders would inevitably come sooner or later into conflict with them, either in a crude manner over the right to exploit the planet's resources, or more probably over the invaders' obsession for propagating their own culture. For by now the civilizing mission, which was the ostensible motive of all their heroic adventures, would have become a rigid obsession. They would be quite incapable of conceiving that the native civilization, though less developed than their own, might be more suited to the natives. Nor could they realize that their own culture, formerly the expression of a gloriously awakened world, might have sunk, in spite of their mechanical powers and crazy religious fervor, below the simpler culture of the natives in all the essentials of mental life. Many a desperate defense did we see, carried out by some world of the lowly rank of Homo sapiens against a race of mad supermen, armed not only with the invincible power of subatomic energy, but with overwhelmingly superior intelligence, knowledge, and devotion, and moreover, with the immense advantage that all its individuals participated in the unified mind of the race. Though we had come to cherish above all things the advancement of mentality, and were therefore prejudiced in favor of the awakened though perverted invaders, our sympathies soon became divided, and then passed almost wholly to the natives, however barbaric their culture. For in spite of their stupidity, their ignorance and superstition, their endless and internecine conflicts, their spiritual obtuseness and grossness, we recognized in them a power which the others had forfeited, a naive but balanced wisdom, an animal shrewdness, a spiritual promise. The invaders, on the other hand, however brilliant, were indeed perverts. Little by little we came to regard the conflict as one in which an untamed but promising urchin had been set upon by an armed religious maniac. When the invaders had exploited every world in the newfound planetary system, they would again feel the lust of proselytization, persuading themselves that it was their duty to advance their religious empire throughout the galaxy. They would detach a couple of planets, and dispatch them into space with a crew of pioneers. Or, they would break up the whole planetary system and scatter it abroad with missionary zeal. Occasionally, their travel brought them into contact with other races of mad superiors. Men would follow a war in which one side or the other, or possibly both, would be exterminated. Sometimes the adventurers came upon worlds of their own rank which had not succumbed to the mania of religious empire. Then the natives, though they would at first meet the invaders with courtesy and reason, would gradually realize that they were confronted with lunatics. They themselves would hastily convert their civilization for warfare. The issue would depend on superiority of weapons and military cunning, but if the contest was long and grim, the natives, even if victorious, might be so damaged mentally by an age of warfare that they would never recover their sanity. Worlds that suffered from the mania of religious imperialism would seek interstellar travel long before economic necessity forced it upon them. The saner world spirits, on the other hand, often discovered sooner or later point beyond which increased material development and increased population were unnecessary for the exercise of their finer capacities. 
These were content to remain within their native planetary systems, in a state of economic and social stability. They were thus able to give most of their practical intelligence to telepathic exploration of the universe. Telepathic intercourse between worlds was now becoming much more precise and reliable. The galaxy had emerged from the primitive stage when any world could remain solitary and live out its career in splendid isolation. In fact, just as in the experience of Homo sapiens, the Earth is now shrinking to the dimensions of a country, so in this critical period of our of the life of our galaxy, the whole galaxy was shrinking to the dimensions of a world. Those world spirits that had been most successful in telepathic exploration had by now constructed a fairly accurate mental map of the whole galaxy, though there still remained a number of eccentric worlds with which no lasting contact could yet be made. There was also one very advanced system of worlds, which had mysteriously faded out of telepathic intercourse altogether. Of this, I shall tell more in the, in, in the sequel. <laughs> the telepathic ability of the mad worlds and system was by now greatly reduced, though they were often under telepathic observation by the more mature world spirits, and were even influenced to some extent they themselves were so self-complacent that they cared not to explore mental life of the galaxy. Physical travel and sacred imperial power were for them good enough means of intercourse with the surrounding universe. In time, there grew up several great rival empires of the mad worlds, each claiming to be charged with some sort of divine mission for the unifying and awakening of the whole galaxy. Exactly. If that's not the title of the second one, I'm going to be so mad. Star Maker 2. Still making stars. <laughs> the perfect title. Between the ideologies of these empires, there was little to choose. Yet each was opposed to the others with religious fervor, germinating in regions far apart. These empires easily mastered any sub-utopian worlds that lay within reach. Thus, they spread from one planetary system to another, till at last empire made contact with empire. Then followed wars such as had never before occurred in our galaxy. Fleets of worlds, natural and artificial, maneuvered among the stars to outwit one another, and destroyed one another with long-range jets of subatomic energy. As the tides of battle swept hither and thither through space, whole planetary systems were annihilated. Many a world spirit found a sudden end. Many a lowly race that had no part in the strife was slaughtered in the celestial warfare that raged around it. Yet so vast is the galaxy that these intermundane war wars, terrible as they were, could at first be regarded as rare accidents, mere unfortunate episodes in the triumphant march of civilization. But the disease spread. More and more of the sane worlds, when they were attacked by the mad empires, reorganized themselves for military defense. They were right in believing that the situation was one with which nonviolence alone could not cope. For the enemy, unlike any possible group of human beings, was too thoroughly purged of humanity to be susceptible to sympathy. But they were wrong in hoping that arms could save them, even though, in the ensuing war, the defenders might gain victory in the end, the struggle was generally so long and devastating that the victors themselves were irreparably damaged in spirit. In a later and perhaps the most terrible phase of our galaxy's life, I was forcibly reminded of the state of bewilderment and anxiety that I had left behind me on the Earth. Little by little, the whole galaxy, some 90,000 light-years away, 
containing more than 30,000 million stars, and, by this date, over 100,000 planetary systems, and actually thousands of intelligent races, was paralyzed by the fear of war, and periodically tortured by its outbreak. In one respect, however, the state of the galaxy was much more desperate than the state of our little world today. None of our nations is an awakened super-individual. Even those peoples which are suffering from the mania of herd glory are composed, by indi are composed of individuals who in their private life are sane. A change of fortune might perhaps drive such a people into a less crazy mood, or skillful propaganda for the idea of human unity might turn the scale. But in this grim age of the galaxy, the mad worlds were mad almost down to the very roots of their being. Each was a super-individual whose whole physical and mental constitution, including the unit bodies and minds of its private members, was by now organized through and through for a mad purpose. There seemed to be no more possibility of appealing to the stunted creatures to rebel against the sacred and crazy purpose of their race than of persuading the individual brain cells of a maniac to make a stand for gentleness. To be alive in those days in one of the worlds that were sane and awakened, though not of the very highest, most percipient order, was to feel, or will be to feel, that the plight of the galaxy was desperate. These average sane worlds had organized themselves into a league to resist aggression, but since they were far less developed in military organization than the mad worlds, and much less inclined to subject their individual members to military despotism, they were at a great disadvantage. Moreover, the enemy was now united, for one empire had secured complete mastery over the worlds, and had inspired all the mad worlds with an identical passion of religious imperialism. Though the united empires of the mad worlds included only a minority of the worlds of the galaxy, the sane worlds had no hope of a speedy recovery, for they were disunited and unskilled in warfare. Meanwhile, war was undermining the mental life of the League's own members. The urgencies and horrors were beginning to blot out from their minds all the more delicate, more developed capacities. They were becoming less and less capable of those activities of personal intercourse and cultural adventure which they still forlornly recognized as the true way of life. The great majority of the worlds of the League finding themselves caught in a trap from which, seemingly, there was no escape, came despairingly to feel that the spirit which they had thought divine, the spirit which seeks true community and true awakening, was after all not designed to triumph, and therefore not the essential spirit of the cosmos. Blind chance, it was rumored, ruled all things or perhaps a diabolic intelligence. Some began to conceive that the Star Maker had created merely for the lust of destroying. Undermined by this terrible surmise, they themselves sank far toward madness. With horror they imagined that the enemy was indeed, as he claimed, the instrument of divine wrath, punishing them for their own impious will to turn the whole galaxy the whole cosmos, into a paradise of generous and fully awakened beings. Under the influence of this growing sense of ultimate satanic power, and the even more devastating doubt of the rightness of their own ideals, the League members despaired. Some surrendered to the enemy, others succumbed to internal discord, losing their mental unity, the war of the worlds seemed likely to end in the victory of the insane. And so, indeed, it would have done, but for the interference of that remote and brilliant system of worlds which, as was mentioned above, had for a long while withdrawn itself from telepathic intercourse with the rest of our galaxy.
this was the system of worlds which had been founded in the springtime of the galaxy by the symbolic ichthyoids and arachnoids end of part two okay so part two is all about re seeing that every planet gets to a point where they're like let's go to space let's do interplanetary and also let's just bop around let's do some cosmic exploring and when the sane worlds or the developed worlds land on planets that are not necessarily developed or not as far in their evolution or whatever however they view it they indoctrinate all of their religion and all of their beliefs and all of their like culture onto this other world and if they travel to a world that is already developed there's gonna be some butting heads not that there's not butting heads with the other planet but they don't necessarily try to impose their will quite as much and it's stated that most of the time well a lot of the time it ends in conflict or sometimes the extermination of both both parties involved so that's cool and totally could not be translated to anything that has ever happened here on earth no there's never been a time when you know a group of people a country say um, is traveling to, I don't know, like another country, and they find um, some fine folk there who they see as not as intelligent and try to, I don't know, like take over, rule. I don't know. I've never seen that before. That's never happened. Oof stretch all right chapter 10 part 3 a crisis in galactic history throughout this period of imperial expansion a few world systems of a very high order the less awakened than the symbiotics of the sub galaxy had watched events telepathically from afar <laughs> uh oh crisis you say they saw the frontiers of empire advancing steadily toward them and knew that they themselves would soon be implicated they had the knowledge and power to defeat the enemy in war they received desperate appeals for help yet they did nothing these were worlds that were organized through and through for peace and the activities proper to an awakened world they knew that, if they chose to remake their whole social structure and reorient, reorientate their minds, they could ensure military victory. They knew also that they would thereby save many worlds from conquest, from oppression, and from the possible destruction of all that was best in them. But they knew also that in reorganizing themselves for desperate warfare, in neglecting for a whole age of struggle, all those activities which were proper to them, they would destroy the best in themselves more surely than the enemy would destroy it by oppression, and that in destroying this they would be murdering what they believed to be the most vital germ in the galaxy. They therefore forswore military action, when at last one of these more developed world systems was itself confronted by mad religious enthusiasts, the natives unwelcomed the invaders, readjusted all their planetary orbits to accommodate the incoming planets, pressed the foreign power actually to settle part of its population in such of their own planets as afforded suitable climatic conditions, and secretly gradually subjected the whole mad race throughout the combined solar system to a course of telepathic hypnotism so potent that its communal mind was completely disintegrated 
the invaders became mere uncoordinated individuals, such as we know on Earth. Henceforth, they were bewildered, short-sighted, torn by conflicts, ruled by no supreme purpose, obsessed more by self than by community. It had been hoped that, when the mad communal mind had been abolished, the individuals of the invading race would soon be induced to open their eyes and their hearts to a nobler ideal. Unfortunately, the telepathic skill of the superior race was not sufficient to delve down to the long-buried chrysalis of the spirit in these beings, to give it air and warmth and light. Since the individual nature of these forlorn individuals was itself the product of a cozy world, they proved incapable of salvation, incapable of sane community. They were therefore segregated to work out their own unlovely destiny in ages of tribal quarrels and cultural decline, ending in the extinction which inevitably overtakes creatures that are incapable of adaptation to new circumstances. When several invading expeditions had been thus circumvented, there arose among the worlds of the mad United Empires a tradition that certain seemingly pacific worlds were, in fact, more dangerous than all other enemies, since plainly they had a strange power of poisoning the soul. The imperialists determined to annihilate these terrible opponents. The attacking forces were instructed to avoid all the telepathic parley and blow the enemy to pieces at long range. This, it was found, could be most conveniently performed by exploding the sun of the doomed system. Stimulated by a potent ray, the atoms of the ph photosphere would start disintegrating, and the spreading fury would soon fling the star into a nova state, roasting all his planets. It was our lot to witness the extraordinary calm, nay, the exultation and joy with which these worlds accepted the prospect of annihilation rather than debase themselves by resistance. Later, we were to watch the strange events which saved this galaxy of ours from disaster. But first came tragedy. From our observation points in the minds of the attackers and the attacked, we observed not once but three times the slaughter of races nobler than any that we had yet encountered by perverts whose own natural mental rank was almost as high. Three worlds, or rather systems of worlds, each possessed by a diversity of specialized races, we saw annihilated. From these doomed planets, we actually observed the sun break out with tumultuous eruption, swelling hourly. We actually felt, through the bodies of our hosts, the rapidly increasing heat, and through their eyes, the blinding light. We saw the vegetation wither, the seas begin to steam, we felt and heard the furious hurricanes which wrecked every structure and bowled the ruins before them. With awe and wonder, we experienced something of that exultation and inner peace with which the doomed angelic populations met their end. Indeed, it was this experienced angelic exultation in the hour of tragedy that gave us our first clear insight into the most spiritual attitude to fate. The sheer bodily agony of the disaster soon became intolerable to us, so that we were forced to withdraw ourselves from those martyred worlds but we left the doomed populations themselves accepting not only this torture, but the annihilation of their glorious community with all its infinite hopes, accepting this bitterness as though it were not lethal, but the elixir of immortality. Not till almost the close of our own adventure did we grasp for a moment the full meaning of this ecstasy. It was strange to us that none of these three victims made any attempt to resist the attack. Indeed, not one inhabitant in any of these worlds considered for a moment the possibility of resistance. 
in every case the attitude of to disaster seemed to express itself in such terms as these to retaliate would be to wound our communal spirit beyond cure we choose rather to die the theme of spirit that we have created must inevitably be broken short whether by the ruthlessness of the invader or by our own resort to arms it is better to be destroyed than to triumph in slaying the spirit such as it is the spirit that we have achieved is fair, and it is indestructibly woven into the tissue of the cosmos. We die praising the universe in which at least such an achievement as ours can be. We die knowing that the promise of further glory outlives us in other galaxies. We die praising the star maker, the star destroyer. That's the end of part three. Okay, so... We got some some destruction, three separate worlds being destroyed, and each time, each of those inhabitants in the world did not resist. They just accepted it. They're like, well, the time has come. <laughs> we will die the way that we have lived, which is not being into war. <laughs> I took too big of a sip. I almost choked myself. Part four. Chapter ten, part four. Triumph in a sub-galaxy. It was after the destruction of the third system of worlds, when a fourth was preparing for its end, that a miracle, or a seeming miracle, changed the whole course of events in our galaxy. Before telling of this turn of fortune, I must double back the thread of my story and trace the history of the system of worlds, which was now to play the leading part in galactic events. Throat's doing all kinds of weird things. Apologies. It will be remembered that in an outlying island off the galactic continent, there lived the strange symbiotic race of ichthyoids and arachnoids, these being supported almost the oldest civilization in the galaxy. They had reached the human plane of mental development even before the other men, and, in spite of many vic vicissitudes, that's a hard one for me to say, vicissitudes, there we go, during the thousands of millions of years of their career, they had made great progress. I referred to them last as having occupied all the planets of their system with specialized races of, an, of arachnoids, all of which were in permanent telepathic union with the ichthyoid population in the oceans of the home planet. As the ages passed, they were several times reduced almost to annihilation, now by two daring physical experiments, now through too ambitious telepathic exploration. But in time, they won through to a mental development unequaled to our galaxy. Their little island universe, their outlying cluster of stars, had come wholly under their control. It contained many natural planetary systems, several of these included worlds which, when the early arachnoid explorers visited them telepathically, were found to be inhabited by native races of pre-utopian rank. These were left to work out their own destiny, save that in certain crises of their history the symbiotics secretly brought to bear on them from afar a telepathic influence that might help them to meet their difficulties with increased vigor. Thus, when one of these worlds reached the crisis in which Homo sapiens now stands, it passed with seemingly natural ease straight on to the phase of world unity and building of utopia. Great care was taken by the symbiotic race to keep its existence hidden from the primitives, lest they should lose their independence of mind. Thus, even while the symbiotics were voyaging among these worlds in rocket vessels and using the mineral resources of neighboring uninhabited planets, 
the intelligent worlds of pre-utopian rank were left unvisited. Not till these worlds had themselves entered the full utopian phase and were exploring their neighboring their neighbor planets were they allowed to discover the truth. By then they were ready to receive it with exultation rather than disheartenment, disheartenment and fear. Thenceforth, by physical and telepathic intercourse, the young Utopia could be speedily brought up to the spiritual rank of the symbiotics themselves, and would cooperate on an equal footing in a symbiosis of worlds. Some of these pre-Utopian worlds, not m malignant but incapable of further advance, were left to peace and preserved as we preserve wild animals and national parks for scientific interest. Eon after eon, these beings, tethered by their own futility, struggled in vain to cope with the crisis which modern Europe knows so well. In cycle after cycle, civilization would emerge from barbarism. Mechanization would bring the peoples into uneasy contact. National wars and class wars would bring the longing for a better world order, but breed it in vain. Disaster after disaster would undermine the fabric of civilization. Gradually, barbarism would return. Eon after eon, the process would repeat itself under the calm telepathic observation of the symbiotics whose existence was never suspected by the primitive creatures under their gaze. So might we ourselves look down into some rock pool where lowly creatures repeat with naive zest dramas learned by their ancestors eons ago. The symbiotics could well afford to leave these museum pieces intact, for they had at their disposal scores of planetary systems. Moreover, armed with their highly developed physical sciences and with subatomic power, they were able to construct, out of space, artificial planets for permanent habitation. These great hollow globes of artificial supermetals and artificial transparent adamant ranged in size from the earliest and smallest structures which were no bigger than a very small asteroid, to spheres considerably larger than the Earth. They were without external atmosphere, since their mass was generally too slight to prevent the escape of gases. A blanket of repelling force protected them from meteors and cosmic rays. The planet's ex external surface, which was wholly transparent, encased the atmosphere. Immediately beneath it hung the photosynthesis stations and the machinery for generating power from solar radiation. Part of this outer shell was occupied by astronomical observatories, machinery for controlling the planet's orbit, and great docks for interplanetary liners. The interior of these worlds was a system of concentric spheres supported by girders and gigantic arches. Interspersed between these spheres lay the machinery for atmospheric regulation, the great water reserves, the food factories and commodity factories, the engineering shops, the refuge conversion tracks, residential and recreational areas, and a wealth of research laboratories, libraries, and cultural centers. Since the symbiotic race was in origin marine, there was a central ocean where the profoundly modified, the physically indolent and mentally athletic descendants of the original ichthyoids constituted the highest brain tracks of the intelligent world. There, as in the primeval ocean of the home planet, the symbiotic partners sought one another, and the young of both species were nurtured. Such races of the sub-galaxy were, as were not in origin marine, constructed, of course, artificial planets which, though of the same general type, 
were adapted to their special nature. But all the races found it also necessary to mold their own nature drastically to suit their new conditions. As the eons advanced, hundreds of thousands of worldlets were constructed, all of this type, but gradually increasing in size and complexity. Many a star without natural planets came to be surrounded by concentric rings of artificial worlds. In some cases, the inner rings contained scores, outer rings thousands of globes adapted to life at some particular distance from the sun. Great diversity, both physical and mental, would distinguish worlds even of the same ring. Sometimes a comparatively old world, or even a whole ring of worlds, would feel itself outstripped in mental excellence by younger worlds and races whose structure, physical and biological, embodied increasing skill. Then either the super annuated world would simply continue its life in a sort of backwater of civilization, tolerated, loved, studied by the younger worlds, or it would choose to die and surrender the material of its planet for new ventures. One very small and rather uncommon kind of artificial world consisted almost wholly of water. It was like a titanic bowl of goldfish. Beneath its transparent shell, studded with rocket machinery and interplanetary docks, lay a spherical ocean, crossed by structural girders and constantly impregnated with oxygen. A small, solid core represented the sea bottom. The population of ichthyoids and the visiting population of arachnoids swarmed in this huge, encrusted drop. Each ichthyoid would be visited in turn by perhaps a score of partners whose working life was spent on other worlds. The life of the ichthyoids was indeed a strange one, for they were at once imprisoned and free of all space. An ichthyoid never left his native ocean, but he had telepathic intercourse with the whole symbiotic race throughout the subgalaxy. Moreover, the one form of practical activity which the ichthyoids performed was astronomy. Immediately beneath the planet's glassy crust hung observatories, where the swimming astronomers studied the constitution of the stars and the distribution of the galaxies. These goldfish bowl worlds turned out to be transitional. Shortly before the age of mad empires, the, symbi the symbiotics began to experiment for the production of a world which should consist of a single physical organism. After ages of experiment, they produced a goldfish bowl type of world in which the whole ocean was meshed by a fixed network of ichthyoid individuals in direct neural connection with one another. This worldwide li living polyp-like tissue had permanent attachments to the machinery and observatories of the world. Thus, it constituted a truly organic world organism, and since the coherent ichthyoid population supported together a perfectly unified mentality, each of these worlds was indeed, in the fullest sense, a minded organism, like a man. One essential link with the past was preserved, Arachnoids, especially adapted to the new symbiosis, would visit from their remote planets and swim along the submarine galleries for union with their anchored mates. More and more of the stars of the outlying cluster or subgalaxy came to be girdled with rings of worlds, and an increasing number of these worlds were of the new organic type. Of the populations of the subgalaxy, most were descendants of the original ichthyoids, or arachnoids, but there were also many whose natural ancestors were humanesque, and not a few that were sprung from avians, insectoids, or plant men. Between the worlds, between the rings of worlds, 
and between the solar systems that were constant intercourse, both telepathic and physical. Small, rocket-propelled vessels plied regularly within each system of planets. Larger vessels, or high-speed worldlets, voyaged from system to system, explored the whole sub-galaxy, and even ventured across the ocean of emptiness into the main body of the galaxy, where thousands upon thousands of planetless stars awaited encirclement by rings of worlds. Strangely, the triumphant advance of material civilization and colonization now slowed down and actually came to a standstill. Physical intercourse between worlds of the sub-galaxy was maintained, but not increased. Physical exploration of the neighboring fringe of the galactic continent was abandoned. Within the sub-galaxy itself, no new worlds were founded. Industrial activities continued, but at reduced pressure, and no further advance was made in the standard of material convenience. Indeed, manners and customs began to grow less dependent on mechanical aids. Among the symbiotic worlds, the arachnoid populations were reduced in number. The ichthyoids in their cells of ocean lived in a permanent state of mental concentration and fervor, which of course was telepathically shared by their partners. Of course. <laughs> it was at this time that telepathic intercourse began between the advanced subgalaxy and the few awakened worlds of the continent was entirely abolished. During recent ages, communication had been very fragmentary. The subgalactics had apparently so far outstripped their neighbors that their interest in those primitives had become purely archaeological and was gradually eclipsed by the enthralling life of their own community of worlds and by their telepathic exploration of remote galaxies. To us, the band of explorers, desperately struggling to maintain contact between our communal mind and the incomparably more developed mind of, those wor of these worlds, the finest activities of the subgalactics were at present inaccessible. We observed only a stagnation of the more obvious physical and mental activities of these systems of worlds. It seemed at first that this stagnation must be caused by some obscure flaw in their nature. Was it, perhaps, the first stage of irrevocable decline? Later, however, we began to discover that this seeming stagnation was a symptom not of death, but of more vigorous life. It's that, like, progression, 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 plateau, and then it just, like, skyrockets. You, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Attention had been drawn from material advancement just because it had be opened up new spheres of mental discovery and growth. In fact, the great community of worlds, whose members consisted of some thousands of world spirits, was busy digesting the fruits of its prolonged phase of physical progress, and was now finding itself capable of new and unexpected psych psychical activities. At first, the nature of these activities was entirely hidden from us, but in time, we learned how to let ourselves be gathered up by these subhuman beings so as to obtain at least an obscure glimpse of the matters which so enthralled them. They were concerned, it seemed, partly with telepathic exploration of the great host of ten million galaxies, partly with the technique of spiritual discipline by which they strove to come to more penetrating insight into the nature of the cosmos, and to a finer creativity. This, we learned, was possible because their perfect community of worlds was tentatively waking into a higher plane of being, as a single communal mind whose body was the whole sub-galaxy of worlds. 
though we could not participate in the life of this lofty being we guessed that its absorbing passion was not wholly unlike the longing of the noblest of our own human species to come face to face with god this new being desired to have the percipience of the hardihood yep hardihood okay just making sure that i read that correctly to endure direct vision of the source of all light and life and love in fact this whole population of worlds was wrapped in a prolonged and mystical adventure okay that's the end of part four Geez, how many parts are going to be in this one chapter? Okay, so in part four, we go back to our symbiotic relationship, the ichthyoids and the arachnoids. And they are sort of hiding themselves from the rest of civilization i guess and they're watching the other worlds develop 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 do the same mistakes and like repeat it eons and eons and eons and they're just like sort of watching and then there is they're developing as well they become astronomers they you know are interested in telepathic uh traveling and all of those sorts of things and there's a point where their development sort of plateaus and it seems like okay what they just did is going to be terrible and they're actually going to decline but in fact the plateau just meant room for more growth exponential growth if you will so that one was a success hooray hooray not a destruction of a world okay the next part has a hilarious title part five is called the tragedy of the perverts <laughs> all right let's get to it part five the tragedy of the perverts what do i have your attention <laughs> Such was the state of affairs when, in the main galactic continent, the mad United Empires concentrated their power upon the few worlds that were not merely sane, but of superior mental rank. The attention of the symbiotics and their colleagues in the supremely civilized sub-galaxy had long been withdrawn from the petty affairs of the continent. It was given instead to the cosmos as a whole, and to the inner discipline of the spirit. But the first of the three murders perpetrated by the United Empires upon a population far more developed than themselves seemed to have caused a penetrating reverberation to echo, so to speak, through all the loftier spheres of existence. Even in the full flight of their career, the subgalactics took cognizance. Once more, attention was directed telepathically to the neighboring continents of stars. While the situation was being studied, the second murder was committed. The subgalactics knew that they had power to prevent any further disaster, yet, to our surprise, our horror and incomprehension, they calmly awaited the third murder. Still more strange, the doomed worlds themselves though in telepathic communication with the sub-galaxy, made no appeal for help. Victims and spectators alike studied the situation with quiet interest, even with a sort of bright exultation not wholly unlike amusement. From our lowlier plane, this detachment, this seeming levity, at first appeared less angelic than inhuman. Here was a whole world of sensitive and intelligent beings in the full tide of eager life and communal activity. Here were lovers newly come together, scientists in the midst of profound research, artists intent on their new delicacies of apprehension, workers in a thousand practical social undertakings of which man has no conception, 
Here, in fact, was all the rich diversity of personal lives that got to make a highly developed world in action. And each of these individual minds participated in the communal mind of all, each experienced not only as a private individual, but as the very spirit of his race. Yet these calm beings faced the destruction of their world with no more distress, seemingly, than one of us would feel at the prospect of resigning his part in some interesting game. And in the minds of the spectators of this impending tragedy, we observed no agony of compassion, but only such commiseration tinged with humor, as we might feel for some distinguished tennis player who has knocked out who was knocked out in the first round of a tournament by some trivial accident, such as a sprained ankle. With difficulty, we came to understand the source of this strange equanimity. Spectators and victims alike were so absorbed in cosmo cosmo cosmological. There we go. We're going to try that sentence over. <laughs> Spectators and victims alike were so absorbed in cosmological research, so conscious of the richness and potentiality of the cosmos, and above all, so possessed by spiritual contemplation, that the destruction was seen, even by the victims themselves, from the point of view which men could call divine. Their exultation and their seeming frivolity were rooted in the fact that, to them, the personal life, and even the life and death of individual worlds, appeared chiefly as vital themes contributing to the life of the cosmos. From the cosmical point of view, the disaster was, after all, a very small, though poignant, matter. Moreover, if by the sacrifice of another group of worlds, even of splendidly awakened worlds, greater insight could be attained into the insanity of the mad empires, the sacrifice was well worth while. So the third murder was committed. Then came the miracle. The telepathic skill of the sub-galaxy was far more developed than that of the scattered superior worlds on the galactic continent. It could dispense with the aid of normal intercourse, and it could overcome every resistance. It could reach right down to the buried chrysalis of the spirit, even in the most perverted individual. This was not a merely destructive power, blotting out the communal mind hypnotically. It was a kindling, an awakening power, brought to bear on the sane but dormant core of each individual. This skill was now exercised upon the galactic continent with triumphant, but also tragic, effect. For even this skill was not omnipotent. There appeared here and there among the mad worlds a strange and spreading disease of the mind. To the orthodox imperialists, in those worlds themselves, it seemed a madness, but it was, in fact, a late and ineffectual waking into sanity on the part of beings whose nature had been molded through and through for madness and a mad environment. The course of this disease of sanity in a mad world ran generally as follows. Individuals here and there, while still playing their part in the well-disciplined action and communal thought of the world, would find themselves teased by private doubts and disgusts opposed to the dearest assumptions of the world in which they lived, doubts of the worth of record-breaking travel and record-breaking empire, and disgust with the cult of mechanical triumph and intellectual servility and the divinity of the race. As these disturbing thoughts increased, the bewildered individuals would begin to fear their own sanity. Presently, they would cautiously sound their neighbors. Little by little, doubt would become more widespread and more vocal until, at last, considerable minorities in each world, though still playing their official part, would lose contact with the communal mind 
and become mere isolated individuals. But individuals at heart, more sane than the lofty communal mind from which they had fallen. The orthodox majority, horrified at this mental disintegration, would then apply the familiar ruthless methods that had been used so successfully in this uncivilized outposts of empire. The dissentients would be arrested and either destroyed outright or concentrated upon the most inhospitable planet in the hope that their torture might prove an effective warning to others. Yikes. <laughs> this policy failed. The strange mental disease spread more and more rapidly till the lunatics outnumbered the sane. There followed civil wars, mass martyrdom of devoted pacifists, dissension among the imperialists, a steady increase of lunacy in every world of the empire. The whole imperial organization fell to pieces, and since the aristocratic worlds that formed the backbone of empire were as imp impotent as soldier ants to maintain themselves without the service and tribute of the subject worlds, the loss of empire doomed them to death. When almost the whole population of such a world had gone sane, great efforts would be made to reorganize its life for self-sufficiency and peace. It might have been expected that this task, though difficult, would not have defeated a population of beings whose sheer intelligence and social loyalty were incomparably greater than anything known on Earth. But there were unexpected difficulties, not economic, but psychological. These beings had been fashioned for war, tyranny, and empire. Though telepathic stimulation from superior minds could touch into life the slumbering germ of the spirit in them and help them to realize the triviality of their world's whole purpose, telepathic influence could not refashion their nature to such an extent that they could henceforth actually live for the spirit and renounce the old life. In spite of heroic self-discipline, they tended to sink into inertia, like wild beasts domesticated, or to run amok and exercise against one another those impulses of domination which hitherto had been directed upon subject worlds, and all this they did with profound consciousness of guilt. For us, it was heartrending to watch the agony of these worlds. Never did the newly enlightened beings lose their vision of true community and of the spiritual life. But though the vision haunted them, the power to realize it in the detail of action was lost. Moreover, there were times when the change of heart that they had suffered seemed to them actually to change for the worse. Formerly, all individuals had been perfectly disciplined to the common will, and perfectly happy in executing that will without the heart-searchings of individual responsibility. But now, individuals were mere individuals, and all were tormented by mutual suspicion and by violent propensities for self-seeking. The issue of this appalling struggle in the minds of these former imperialists depended on the extent to which specialization for empire had affected them. In a few young worlds in which specialization had not gone deep, a period of chaos was followed by a period of reorientation and world planning, and in due season by sane utopia. But in most of these worlds, no such escape was possible. Either chaos persisted till racial decline set in, and the world sank to the human and subhuman, the merely animal states, or else, in a few cases only, the discrepancy between the ideal and the actual were so distressing that the whole race committed suicide. Jeez. We could not 
long endure the spectacle of scores of worlds without falling into psychological ruin. Yet the subgalactics who had caused these strange events and continued to use their power to clarify and so destroy these minds watched their handiwork unflinchingly. Pity they felt. Pity such as we feel for a child that has broken its toy, but no indignation against fate. Within a few thousand years, every one of the imperial worlds had either transformed itself, or fallen into barbarism, or committed suicide. Jeez. Okay, so, this chapter. We get a glimpse into individuals leaving the hive mind, basically. So they're all connected, and they all have, like, a similar thought. They are all able to share the same thoughts, ideals, nobody really questions anything, and then people start to break off, and they lose that connection, that mental telepathic connection, and then more people start to do it, and they start to ask questions, and they start to sort of defy things, and so we're getting almost a revolt where there are more people who are lunatics or the people who have branched off than there are the people who are sane. So that switch of the tides is interesting and also has totally never happened on Earth. Need I remind you, this is all in space, so... <laughs> that was the end of part five. And it looks like we have another part. How many parts there are in this one chapter, I am not sure. Yeah, at the end of each of this section, I like to sort of um, remind myself what happens, if that makes sense. Reading out loud is like a totally different skill set into like remembering what happened. Let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, I need to like readjust how I'm sitting. I like cramped. I cramped. Okay, here we go. All right. Get my reading voice back. <sighs> Part 6 of Chapter 10. A Galactic Utopia. The events that I have been describing took place, or from the human point of view, will take place at a date as far future to us as we are from the condensation of the earliest stars. The next period of galactic history covers the period from the fall of the Mad Empires to the achievement of Utopia and the whole galactic community of worlds. This transitional period was in itself, in a manner, utopian. For it was an age of triumphant progress carried out by beings whose nature was rich and harmonious, whose nurture was entirely favorable, and their ever-widening galactic community, wholly satisfying object, object of loyalty. It was not only utopian in the sense that the galactic society was still expanding and constantly changing its structure. Did I already read that? No, I didn't. Okay. I'm just lost. <laughs> It was not, it was, oh my gosh, okay, it was only not utopian in the sense that the galactic society was still expanding and constantly changing its structure to meet new needs, economic and spiritual. At the close of this phase, there came a period of full utopia in which the attention of the perfected galactic community was directed mainly beyond itself toward other galaxies. Of this I shall tell in due course, and of the unforeseen and stormy events which shattered this beatitude. Meanwhile, we must glance at the age of expansion, the worlds of the sub-galaxy, recognizing that no further advance in culture was possible unless the population of awakened worlds was immensely increased and diversified 
now began to play an active part in the work of reorganizing the whole galactic continent. By telepathic communication, they gave to all awakened worlds throughout the galaxy knowledge of the triumphant society which they themselves had created, and they called upon all to join them in the founding of the galactic utopia. Every world throughout the galaxy, they said, must be an intensely conscious individual, and each must contribute its personal idiosyncrasies and all the wealth of its experience to the pooled experience of all. When at last the community was completed, they said, it must go on to fulfill its function in the far greater community of all galaxies, there to participate in spiritual activities as yet but dimly guessed. In their earlier age of meditation, the subgalactic worlds, or rather, the single intermittently awakening mind of the subgalaxy, and evidently had evidently made discoveries which had very precise bearing on the founding of the galactic society, for they now put forward the demand that the number of minded worlds in the galaxy must be increased to at least 10,000 times its present extent. In order that all the potentialities of the spirit should be fulfilled, they said there must be a far greater diversity of world types and thousands of worlds of each type. They themselves, in their small subgalactic community, had learned enough to realize that only a very much greater community could explore all the regions of being, some few of which they themselves had glim glimpsed but only from afar. The natural worlds of the galactic continent were bewildered and alarmed by the magnitude of this scheme. They were content with the extent, with the extant scale of life. The spirit, they affirmed, had no concern for magnitude and multiplicity. To this, the reply was made that such a protest came ill from worlds whose own achievement depended on the splendid diversity of their members. Diversity and multiplicity of worlds was as necessary on the galactic plane as diversity and multiplicity of the individuals on the fourth plane and diversity and multiplicity of nerve cells on the individual plane. In the upshot, the natural worlds of the continent played a decreasing part in the advancing life of the galaxy. Some merely remained at the level of their own unaided achievement. Some joined in the great cooperative work, but without fervor and without genius. A few joined heartily and usefully in the enterprise. One, indeed, was able to contribute greatly. This was a symbiotic race, but of a very different kind from that which had founded the community of the sub-galaxy. The symbiosis consisted of two races which had originally inhabited separate planets of the same system. An intelligent avian species, driven to desperation by the desiccation of its native planet, had contrived to invade a neighboring world inhabited by a man-like species. Here I must not tell how, after ages of alternating strife and cooperation, a thorough economic and psychological symbiosis was established. The building of the galactic community of worlds lies far beyond the comprehension of the writer of this book. I cannot now remember at all clearly what I experienced of these obscure matters in the state of heightened lucidity which came to me through participation in the communal mind of the explorers. And even in that state, I was bewildered by the effort to comprehend the aims of that close-knit community of worlds. If my memory is to be trusted at all, Three kinds of activity occupied the minded worlds in this phase of galactic history. The main practical world was to enrich and harmonize the life of the galaxy itself, 
to increase the number and diversity and mental unity of the fully awakened worlds up to the point which, it was believed, was demanded for the emergence of a mode of experience more awakened than any hitherto attained. Second kind of activity was that which sought to make closer contact with the other galaxies by physical and telepathic study. The third was the spiritual exercise appropriate to beings of the rank of the world minds. The last seems to have been concerned, or will be concerned, at once with the deepening of the self-awareness of each individual world spirit and the detachment of its will from merely private fulfillment. But this was not all. For on this relatively high level of the spirit's ascent, as on our own lowliest of all spiritual planes, there had also to be a more radical detachment from the whole adventure of life and mind in the cosmos. For, as the spirit, as the spirit wakens, it craves more and more to regard all existence not merely with a creature's eyes, but in the universal view, as though through the eyes of the creator. At first, the task of establishing the galactic utopia occupied almost the whole energy of the awakened worlds. More and more of the stars were encircled with concentric hoops of pearls, perfect though artificial. And each pearl was a unique world, occupied by a unique race. Henceforth, the highest level of persistence individuality was not a world, but a system of scores or hundreds of worlds. And between the systems, there was an easy and delightful con converse as between human individuals. In these conditions, to be a conscious individual was to enjoy immediately the united sensory impressions of all the races inhabiting a system of worlds. And as the sense organs of the worlds apprehend not only nakedly, but also through artificial instruments of great range and subtlety, the conscious individual perceived not only the structure of hundreds of planets, but also the configuration of the whole system of planets clustered about its sun. Other systems also it perceived, as men perceive one another, for in the distance the glittering bodies of other multi-mundane persons, like itself, gyrated and drifted. Between the minded planetary systems occurred infinite variations of personal intercourse, as between human individuals. There were loves and hates, temperamental sympathies and antipathies, joyful and distressful intimacies, cooperation and thwartings in personal ventures, and in the great common venture of building the galactic utopia. Between individual systems of worlds, as between symbiotic partners, there sometimes occurred relationships with an almost sexual flavor, though actual sex played no part in them. Neighboring systems would project traveling worldlets or greater worlds, or trains of worlds across the ocean of space to take up orbits round each other's suns and play intimate parts in symbiotic, or rather, psychic relationships in one another's private life. Occasionally, a whole system would migrate to another system and settle its worlds in rings between the rings of the other systems. Telepathic intercourse united the whole galaxy, but telepathy, though it had the great advantage that it was not affected by distance, was seemingly imperfect in other ways. So far as possible, it was supplemented by physical travel. A constant stream of touring worldlets percolated through the whole galaxy in every direction. The task of establishing utopia in the galaxy was not pursued without friction. Different kinds of races were apt to have different policies for the galaxy. The war was by now unthinkable. The sort of strife which we know between individuals 
or associations within the same state was common. There was, for instance, the constant struggle between the planetary systems that were chiefly interested in the building of Utopia. Those that were most concerned to make contact with other galaxies, and those whose main preoccupation was spiritual. Besides these great parties, there were groups of planetary systems which were prone to put the well-being of individual world systems above the advancement of galactic enterprise. They cared more for the drama of personal intercourse and the fulfillment of the personal capacity of worlds and systems than for organization or exploration or spiritual pur purification. Though their presence was often exasperating to the enthusiasts, it was salutary, for it was a guarantee against extravagance and against tyranny. It was during the age of the Galactic Utopia that another salutary influence began to take full effect on the busy worlds. Telepathic research had made contact with the long, extinct plant men, who had been undone by the extravagance of their own mystic mystical quietism. The utopian worlds now learned much from these archaic but uniquely sensitive beings. Henceforth, the vegetal mode of experience was thoroughly, but not dangerously, knit into the texture of the galactic mind. And that is the end of the chapter, and I totally thought that we were on chapter 10 this whole time. We were not. We were on chapter 9 this whole time. Oopsie doopsie. Oopsie doopsie. Because right now, I'm seeing before me that we're about to start chapter 10. Oopsie poopsie. It's fine, right? It's fine. Bonus chapter, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the parts weren't long enough. We must have a bonus chapter. Okay. So, chapter nine was a doozy, yeah. It was a long one, and that's fine. This next chapter is definitely not two hours long, so that's cool. Um, I forgot, I think there's 18 chapters in this, so, I mean... Percentage-wise, we've definitely reached more than the halfway point, but I'm just checking to see. There are, oh no, there's only 16, and 16, the 16th chapter, it's the epilogue. Yeah, right now we are two-thirds of the way through. We're doing it. We're making progress. Though the chapters may seem long and have parts to them, we are making progress. And I'm excited, so... It seems like, yes, there's a lot of commentary, but it also seems like there's a lot of build-up for something really momentous to happen, if that makes sense. And I feel like that happens in, well, at least it happened in The Left Hand of Darkness um, by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, there was a lot of, like, information that we got and then like a lot of the action action stuff happened at the end so i'm wondering if that's what's going to happen i don't know i guess we should find out but first okay chapter 10 a vision of the galaxy it seemed to us now that the troubles of the many worlds of this galaxy were at last over, that the will to support the galactic utopia was now universal, and that the future must bring glory after glory. We felt assured of the same progress in other galaxies. In our simplicity, we looked forward to the speedy, the complete and final triumph of the striving spirit throughout the cosmos. We even conceived that the star maker rejoiced in the perfection of his work. Using such symbols as we could to express the inexpressible, we imagined that, before the beginning, the star maker was alone, and that for love and for community, 
he resolved to make a perfect creature to be his mate. We imagined that he made her of his hunger for beauty and his will for love, but that he also scourged her in the making and tormented her so that she might at last triumph over all diversity, adversity, excuse me, not triumph over diversity, and thereby achieve such perfection as he and his almightiness could never attain. The cosmos we received to be that creature, and it seemed to us in our simplicity that we had already witnessed the greater part of cosmical growth, and that there remained only the climax of that growth, the telepathic union of all the galaxies to become the single, fully awakened spirit of the cosmos, perfect, fit to be eternally contemplated and enjoyed by the star maker. All this seemed to us majestically right, yet we ourselves had no joy in it. We had been sated with the spectacle of continuous and triumphant progress in the latter age of our galaxy, and we were no longer curious about the host of the other galaxies. Almost certainly, they were much like our own. We were, in fact, overwhelmingly fatigued and disillusioned. During so many eons, we had followed the fortunes of the many worlds. So often we had lived out their passions, novel to them, but to us, for the most part, repetitive. We had shared all kinds of sufferings, all kinds of glories and shames, and now that the cosmical ideal, the full awakening of the spirit, seemed on the point of attainment, we found ourselves a little tired of it. What matter whether the huge, the whole huge drama of existence should be intricately known and relished by the perfected spirit or not? What matter whether we ourselves should complete our pilgrimage or not? During so many eons, our company, distributed throughout the galaxy, had with difficulty maintained its single communal mentality. At all times, we, in spite of our severalty, were in fact I, the single observer of the many worlds, but the maintaining of this identity was itself becoming a toil. I was overpowered with sleepiness. We, severally, longed for our little native worlds, our homes, our lairs, and for the animal obtuseness that had walled us in from all the immensities. In particular, I, the Englishman, longed to be sleeping safely in that room where she and I had slept together, the day's urgencies all blotted out, and nothing left but sleep and the shadowy, the peaceful awareness in each of the other. But though I was fatigued beyond spirit, seemed on the point of attainment, we found ourselves a little tired of it. What matter whether the whole huge drama of existence should be intricately known and relished by the perfected spirit or not? What matter whether we ourselves should complete our pilgrimage or not? During so many eons, our company, distributed throughout the galaxy, had with difficulty maintained its single communal mentality. At all times, we, in spite of our severality, were, in fact, I, the single observer of many worlds. Wait a minute, what just happened? Did I go back a page? I totally did. I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm not going to repeat that all over again. I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Okay. But though I was fatigued beyond endurance, sleep would not come. I remained perforce with my colleagues and with many triumphant worlds. I must have hit back. I am so sorry. Slowly, we were roused from our drowsiness by a discovery. 
it gradually appeared to us that the prevailing mood of these countless utopian worlds these countless utopian systems of worlds was at heart very different from that of triumph in every world we found a deep conviction of the littleness and impotence of all finite beings no matter how exalted in a certain world there was a kind of poet when we told him our conception of the cosmical goal he said when the cosmos wakes if ever she does she will find herself not the single beloved of her maker but merely a little bubble adrift on the boundless and bottomless ocean of being what had seemed to us at first the irresistible march of godlike world spirits with all the resources of the universe in their hands and all eternity before them was now gradually revealed in very different guise the great advance in mental caliber and the attainment of communal mentality throughout the cosmos had brought a change in the experience of time the temporal reach of the mind had been very greatly extended the awakened worlds experienced an eon as a mere crowded day they were aware of time's passage as man in a canoe might have cognizance of a river which in its upper reaches is sluggish but consequently breaks into rapids and becomes swifter and swifter till at no great distance ahead it must plunge in a final cataract down to the sea namely to the eternal end of life the extinction of the stars comparing the little respite that remained with the great work which they passionately desired to accomplish namely the fully awakening of the cosmical spirit they saw that at best there was no time to spare and that more probably it was already too late to accomplish the task they had a strange foreboding that unforeseen disaster lay in store for them it was sometimes said we know not what the stars even have in store for us still less what the star maker and it was sometimes said we should not for a moment consider even our best established knowledge of existence as true it is awareness only of the colors that our own vision paints on the film of one bubble in one strand of foam on the ocean of being the sense of the faded incompleteness of all creatures and of all their achievements gave to the galactic society of worlds a charm a sanctity as of some short-lived and delicate flower and it was with an increasing sense of precarious beauty that we ourselves were now learning to regard the far-flung utopia in this mood we had a remarkable experience we had embarked upon a sort of holiday from exploration seeking the refreshment of disembodied flight in space gathering our whole company together out of all the worlds we centered ourselves into a single mobile viewpoint and then as one being we glided and circled among the stars and nebulae presently the whim took us to plunge into outer space we hastened till the forward stars turned violet the hinder red till both forward and hinder vanished till all visible features were extinguished by the wild speed of our flight in absolute darkness we brooded on the origin and the destiny of the galaxies and on the appalling contrast between the cosmos and our minute home lives to which we longed to return presently we came to rest in doing so we discovered that our situation was not such as we expected the galaxy whence we had emerged did indeed lie far behind us no bigger than a great cloud but it was not the featured spiral that it should have been after some confusion of mind we realized that we were looking at the galaxy in an early stage of its of its existence in fact at a time before it was really a galaxy at all for the cloud it was no cloud of stars but a continuous mist of light 
at its heart was a vague brilliance which faded softly into the dim outer regions and merged without a perceptible boundary into the black sky even the sky itself was quite unfamiliar though empty of stars it was densely peopled with a great number of pale clouds all seemingly were farther from us than that from which we had come but several bulked as largely as orion in the earth's sky so congested was the heaven that many of the great objects were continuous with one another in their filmy extremities and many were separated only by mere channels of emptiness through which loomed vistas of more remote nebulae some of them so distant as to be mere spots of light it was clear that we had travelled back through time to a date when the great nebulae were still near neighbours to one another before the explosive nature of the cosmos had done more than separate them out from the continuous and congested primal substance as we watched it became obvious that events were unfolding before us with fantastic speed each cloud visibly shrank withdrawing into the distance it also changed its shape each vague orb flattened somewhat and became more definite receding and therefore diminishing the nebulae now disappeared as lens-shaped mists tilted at all angles but even as we watched they withdrew themselves so far into the depths of space that it became difficult to observe their changes only our own native nebula remained beside us a huge oval stretching across half the sky on this we now concentrated our attention differences began to appear within it regions of brighter and of less bright mist faint streaks and swirls like the foam on the sea's waves these shadowy features slowly moved as wisps of cloud move on the hills presently it was clear that the internal currents of the nebula were on the whole set in a common pattern the great world of gas was in fact slowly rotating almost as a tornado as it rotated it continued to flatten it was now like some blurred image of a streaked and flattish pebble handy for ducks and drakes held too near the eye to be focused presently we noticed with our novel and miraculous vision that microscopic points of intenser light were appearing here and there throughout the cloud but mainly in its outer regions as we watched their number grew and the spaces between them grew dark thus were the stars born the great cloud still span and flattened it was soon a disk of whirling star streams and strands of uncondensed gas the light the last disintegrating tissues of the primal nebula these continued to move within the whole by their own semi-independent activity changing their shapes creeping like living things extending pseudopodia and visibly fading as clouds fade but giving place to a new generations of stars the heart of the nebula was now condensing into a smaller bulk more clearly defined it was a huge congested globe of brilliance here and there throughout the disk knots and lumps of light were the embryonic star clusters the whole nebula was strewn with these balls of thistledown these feathery sparkling fairy decorations each one in fact pregnant with a small universe of stars the galaxy for such it could now be named continued visibly to whirl with hypnotic constancy its tangled tresses of star streams were spread abroad on the darkness now it was like a huge broad brimmed white sombrero the crown a glowing mass the brim a filmy expanse of stars 
the two long whirling tassels on the brim were two long spiraling star streams. Their frayed extremities had broken away and become sub-galaxies, revolving about the main galactic system. The whole, like a spinning top, swayed, and, as it tilted before us, the brim appeared as an ever-narrowing, ever-narrower ellipse, till presently it was on, it was edge on, and the outermost fringe of it, composed of non-luminous matter, formed a thin, dark, knotted line across the glowing inner substance of nebula and stars. Peering, straining to see more precisely the texture of this shimmering and nacreous wonder, this largest of all the kinds of objects in the cosmos, we found that our new vision, even while embracing the whole galaxy and the distant galaxies, apprehended each single star as a tiny disk separated from its nearest neighbors, much as a cork on the Arctic Ocean could be separated from another cork on the Antarctic. Thus, in spite of the nebulous and opulescent beauty of its general form, the galaxy also appeared to us as a void sprinkled with very sparse scintillations. Observing the stars more closely, we saw that while they streamed along in companies like shoals of fishes, their currents sometimes interper interpenetrated. Then, seemingly, the stars of the different streams, crossing one another's paths, pulled at one another moving in great sweeping curves as they passed from one neighbor's influence to another. Thus, in spite of their remoteness, each from each, the stars often looked curiously like minute living creatures taking cognizance of one another from afar. Sometimes they swung hyperbolically round one another and away, or, more rarely, united to form binaries. So rapidly did time pass before us that eons were packed into moments. We had seen the first stars condense from the nebular tissue as ruddy giants, though in the remote view inconceivably minute. A surprising number of these, perhaps through the centrifugal force of their rotation, were burst asunder to form binaries so that, increasingly, the heaven was peopled by these waltzing pairs. Meanwhile, the giant stars slowly shrank and gathered brightness. They passed from red to yellow and on to dazzling white and blue, while other young giants condensed around them. They shrank still further, and their color changed once more to yellow and to smoldering red. Presently we saw the eldest of the stars one by one extinguished like sparks from a fire. The incidence of this mortality increased, slowly but steadily. Sometimes a nova flashed out and faded, outshining for a moment all its myriad neighbors. Here and there a variable pulsated with inconceivable rapidity. Now and again we saw a binary and a third star approach one another so closely that one or other of the group reached out a filament of its substance toward its partner. Straining our supernatural vision, we saw these filaments break and condense into planets. And we were awed by the infinitesimal size and the rarity of these seeds of life among the lifeless host of the stars but the stars themselves gave an irresistible impression of vitality. Strange that the movements of these merely physical things, these mere fireballs whirling and traveling according to the geometrical laws of their minutest particles, should seem so vital, so questing. But then the whole galaxy was itself so vital, so like an organism, with its delicate tracery of star streams, like the streams within a living cell, and its extended wreaths, almost like feelers, and its nucleus of light. 
surely this great and lovely creature must be alive must have intelligent experience of itself and of things other than it in the tide of these wild thoughts we checked our fancy remembering that only on the rare grains called planets can life gain foothold and on that all this wealth of restless jewels was but a waste of fire with rising affection and longing we directed our attention more minutely towards the earliest planetary grains as they condensed out of the whirling filaments of flame to become at first molten drops that span and pulsated then grew rock encrusted ocean filled and swathed in atmosphere our piercing sight observed their shallow waters ferment with life which soon spread into their oceans and continents a few of these early worlds we saw awaken to intelligence of human rank and very soon these were in the throes of the great struggle for the spirit from which still fewer emerged victorious meanwhile new planetary births rare among the stars yet in all thousands upon thousands had launched new worlds and new biographies we saw the other earth with its recurrent glories and shames and its final suffocation we saw the many other humanesque worlds echnoderm centaurian and so on we saw man on his little earth blunder through many alternating phases of dullness and lucidity and again abject dullness from epoch to epoch his bodily shape changed as a cloud changes we watched him in his desperate struggle with martian invaders and then after a moment that included further ages of darkness and of light we saw him driven by dread of the moon's downfall away to hospitable venus later still after an eon that was a mere sigh in the lifetime of the cosmos he fled before the exploding sun to neptune there to sink back into mere animality for further eons again but then he climbed once more and reached his first intelligence only to be burnt up like a moth in a flame by irresistible catastrophe all this long human story most passionate and tragic in the living was but an unimportant a seemingly barren and negligible effort lasting only for a few moments in the life of the galaxy when it was over the host of the planetary systems still lived on with here and there a cause a cause a causality casualty oh my gosh i can read i promise only sometimes though we're gonna start that sentence over when it was over the host of the planetary systems still lived on with here and there a casualty and here and there among the stars a new planetary birth and here and there a fresh disaster before and after man's troubled life we saw other humanesque races rise in scores and hundreds of which a mere handful was destined to waken beyond man's highest spiritual range to play a part in the galactic community of worlds these we now saw from afar on their little earth-like planets scattered among the huge drift of the star streams struggling to master all those world problems social and spiritual which man in our modern era is for the first time confronting similarly we saw again the many other kinds of races nautiloid submarine avian composite and rare symbiotics and still rarer plant-like beings and of every kind only a few if any won through to utopia and took part in the great communal enterprise of worlds the rest fell by the way from our remote lookout we now saw in one of the islanded sub-galaxies the triumph of the symbiotics 
Here, at last, was the germ of a true community of worlds. Presently, the stars of this islet universe began to be girdle girdled with living pearls till the whole sub-galaxy was alive with worlds. Meanwhile, in the main system arose that fr flagrant and contagious insanity of empire which we had already watched in detail. But what had before appeared as a war of titans, in which great worlds maneuvered in space with inconceivable speed and destroyed one another's populations in holocausts, was now seen as the jerky motion of a few microscopic sparks, a few luminous animalcules, surrounded by the indifferent stellar hosts. Presently, however, we saw a star blaze up and destroy its planets. The empires had murdered something nobler than themselves. There was a second murder, and a third. Then, under the influence of the sub-galaxy, the imperial madness faded, and empire crumbled. And soon our fatigued attention was held by the irresistible coming of utopia throughout the galaxy. This was visible to us chiefly as a steady increase of artificial planets. Star after star blossomed with orbit after crowded orbit of these vital jewels, these blooms pregnant with the spirit. Constellation after constellation, the whole galaxy became visibly alive with myriads of worlds, each world peopled with its unique, multitudinous race of sensitive individual intelligences united in true community, was itself a living thing, possessed of a common spirit. And each system of many populous orbits was itself a communal being. And the whole galaxy, knit in a single telepathic mesh, was a single intelligent and ardent being, the common spirit, the eye of all its countless diverse and ephemeral individuals. This whole vast community looked now beyond itself toward its fellow galaxies, resolved to pursue the adventure of life and of spirit in the cosmical, the widest of all spheres. It was in constant telepathic communication with its fellows, and at the same time, conceiving all kinds of strange, practical ambitions, it began to avail itself of the energies of its stars upon a scale hitherto unimagined. Not only was every solar system now surrounded by a gauze of light traps, which focused the escaping solar energy for intelligent use, so that the whole galaxy was dimmed, but many stars that were not suited to be suns were disintegrated and rifled of their prodigious stores of subatomic energy. Suddenly, our attention was held by an event which even at a distance was visibly incompatible with utopia. A star encircled by planets exploded, destroying all its rings of worlds and sinking afterwards into wane exhaustion. Another and another, and yet others in different regions of the galaxy did likewise. To inquire into the cause of these startling disasters, we once more, by an act of volition, dispersed ourselves to our stations among the many worlds. End of chapter 10. Let's see. Okay, so, recapping chapter, the actual chapter 10, not the fake chapter 10s that I thought we were reading. Um, it was very much seeing, like, the start of a universe, like, watching the stars and traveling through. It was very vibing for a while, just, like, going and being in space and watching stars happen and die and all of that stuff. And then also being able to see, like, because you're watching, like, this progression, but seeing human-esque species 
repeat the same issues in all of these different spaces. Which is interesting. I think. And also noting that not very many worlds make it past to the utopian state. It's more likely that they're destroyed before they reach that. Also interesting. Okay, let me have a sip. And one more thing that they mentioned was that while watching all of this and seeing all of these experiences and everything like that, still having the want to be back home and be with your partner. Even though at the very beginning it was stated like, yeah, I'm with, I'm with my partner. I love my partner so, so much. And this only matters to me. Like, it doesn't have a broader, wider impact on, like, anything. So I just think that's interesting. That it, like, keeps circling back to, like, yeah, I've seen all of these things, but also, I kind of want to be home. Maybe watching Netflix, having a snack, hanging out with my person. <laughs> or dog. I don't know, pet, cat. All right, chapter 11. Stars and Vermin. An excellent chapter title. Part 1. The Many Galaxies. The Galactic Society of Worlds had sought to perfect its communication with other galaxies. The simpler medium of contact was telepathic, but it seemed desirable to reach out physically also across the whole void between this galaxy and the next. It was in the attempt to send envoys on such voyages that the Society of Worlds brought upon itself the epidemic of exploding stars. Before describing the series of disasters, I shall say something of the conditions of other galaxies as they were known to us through our participation in the experience of our own galaxy. Telepathic exploration had long ago revealed that at least in some other galaxies there existed minded worlds. And now, after long experiment, the worlds of our galaxy, working for this purpose as a single galactic mind, had attained much more detailed knowledge of the cosmos as a whole. This had proved difficult because of an unsuspected parochialism in the mental attitude of the worlds of each galaxy. In the basic physical and biological constitutions of the galaxies, there was no far-reaching difference. In each, there was a diversity of races of the same general types as those of our own galaxy, but upon the cultural plane, the trend of development in each galactic society had produced important mental idiosyncrasies, often so deep-seated as to be unwitting. Thus, it was very difficult at first for the development, for the developed, for the developed galaxies to make contact with one another. Our own galactic culture had been dominated by the culture of the symbiotics, which had developed in the exceptionally happy subgalaxy. In spite of the horrors of the Imperial Age, ours was therefore a culture having a certain blandness which made telepathic intercourse with more tragic galaxies difficult to establish. Further, the detail of basic concepts and values accepted by our own galactic society was also largely a development of the marine culture that had dominated the sub-galaxy. Through the continental population of worlds was mainly humanesque. Its natives' culture had been profoundly influenced by the oceanic mentality. And since this oceanic mentality texture was rare amongst galactic societies, our galaxy was rather more isolated than most. 
After long and patient work, however, our galactic society succeeded in forming a fairly complete survey of the cosmical population of galaxies. It was discovered that at this time the many galaxies were in many stages of mental as of physical development. Many young, many very young systems in which nebular matter still predominated over stars contained as yet no planets. In others, though already there was a sprinkling of the vital grains, life had nowhere reached the human level. Some galaxies, though physically mature, were wholly barren of planetary systems, either through sheer accident or by reason of the exceptionally sparse distribution of their stars. In several, out of the millions of galaxies, a single intelligent world had spread its race and its culture throughout the galaxy, organizing the whole as an egg's germ organizes itself into itself the whole substance of the egg. In these galaxies, very naturally, the galactic culture had been based on the assumption that from the one single germ the whole cosmos was to be peopled. When telepathic intercourse with other galaxies was at last stumbled upon, its effect was at first utterly bewildering. There were not as few galaxies in which two or more such germs had developed interdependently and finally come into contact. Sometimes the result was symbiosis, sometimes endless strife, or even mutual destruction. By far the commonest type of galactic society was that in which many systems of worlds had developed independently, come into conflict, conflict slaughtered one another, produced vast federations and empires, plunged again and again into social chaos, and struggled between whiles haltingly toward galactic utopia. A few had already attained that goal, though seared with bitterness. More were still floundering. Many were so undermined by war that there seemed little prospect of recovery. To such a type our own galaxy would have belonged had it not been for the good fortune of the symbiotics. To this account of the galactic survey, two points should be added. First, there were certain very advanced galactic societies which had been telepathic spectators of all history in our own and all other galaxies. Secondly, in not a few galaxies, the stars had recently begun unexpectedly exploding and destroying their girdles of worlds. That's the end of the first part. It was much shorter than I thought. All of the other first parts have been like 20 minutes or something. We'll do part two. Oh yes, take care of the little bean. <laughs> All right. Chapter 11, part two, disaster in our galaxy. While our galactic society of worlds was perfecting its telepathic vision and at the same time improving its own social and material structure, the unexpected disasters which we had already observed from afar forced it to attend strictly to the task of preserving the lives of its constituent worlds. The occasion of the first accident was an attempt to detach a star from its natural course and direct it upon an intergalactic voyage. Telepathic intercourse with the nearest of the foreign galaxies was fairly reliable, but, as I have said, it had been decided that a physical exchange of worlds would be invaluable for mutual understanding and cooperation. Plans were therefore made for projecting several stars with their attendant systems of worlds across the vast ocean of space that separated the two floating islets of civilization. The voyage would, of course, be thousands of times longer than anything hitherto attempted. At its completion, many more of the stars in each galaxy would already have ceased to shine, 
and the end of all life in the cosmos would already be in sight. Yet, it was felt that the enterprise of linking galaxy with galaxy throughout the cosmos in this manner would be well justified by the great increase of mutual insight which it would produce in the galaxies in the last and most difficult phase of cosmical life. Other prodigies of experiment and calculation, the first attempt at intergalactic voyaging, was undertaken. A certain star, barren of planets, was used as a reservoir of energy, both normal and subatomic. By cunning devices, far beyond my comprehension, this fund of power was directed upon a chosen star with planetary gir girdles in such a way as to sway it gradually in the direction of the foreign galaxy. The task of securing that its planets should remain in their true orbits during this operation and during the subsequent acceleration of their sun was very delicate but was accomplished without the destruction of more than a dozen worlds. Unfortunately, just as the star was correctly aimed and was beginning to gather speed, it exploded. A sphere of incandescent material, expanding from the sun with incredible speed, swallowed up and destroyed every girdle of planets. The star then subsided. Throughout the history of the galaxy, such a sudden effulgence and acquiescence of a star had been a very common occurrence. It was known to consist of an explosion of subatomic energy from the star's superficial layers. This was caused sometimes by the impact of some small wandering body, often no bigger than an asteroid, sometimes by factors in the star's own physical evolution. In either case, the Galactic Society of Worlds could predict the event with great accuracy and take steps either to divert the intruding body or to remove the threatened world system out of harm's way. But this particular disaster was entirely unforeseen. No cause could be assigned to it. It infringed the established laws of physics. While the Society of Worlds was trying to understand what had happened, another star exploded. This was the sun of one of the leading world systems. Attempts had recently been made to increase this star's output of radiation, and it was thought that the disaster must have been due to these experiments. After a while, another and yet other stars exploded, destroying all their worlds. In several cases, attempts had recently been made either to alter the star's course or tap its stored energy. The trouble spread. System after system of worlds was destroyed. All tampering with stars had now been abandoned, yet the epidemic of novae continued, even increased. In every case, the exploding star was a sun with a planetary system. The normal nova phase the explosion caused not by collision but by internal forces was known to occur only in a star's youth or early maturity and seldom, if ever, more often than once in each star's career. In this late phase of the galaxy, far more stars had passed the natural nova stage than not. It would be possible, therefore, to move whole systems of worlds from the dangerous younger stars and settle them in close orbits round the older luminaries. With immense expense of energy, this operation was several times performed. Heroic plans were made for the transformation of the whole galactic society by migration to the safe stars and the euthanasia of the excess population of worlds that could not be thus accommodated. While this plan was being carried out, it was defeated by a new series of disasters. Stars that had already exploded developed a power of exploding again and again whenever they were girdled with planets. Moreover, yet another kind of disaster now began to occur. Very aged stars 
which had long since passed the period when explosion was possible, began to behave in an astounding manner. A plume of incandescent substance would issue from the photosphere, and this, as the star revolved, would sweep outwards as a trailing whirl. Sometimes this fiery proboscis calcined the surface of every planet in every orbit, killing all its life. Sometimes, if the sweep of the proboscis was not quite in the plane of the planetary orbits, a number of planets escaped. But in many cases in which the destruction was not at first complete, the proboscis gradually brought itself more accurately into the planetary plane and destroyed the remaining worlds. It soon became clear that, if the two kinds of stellar activity remained unchecked, civilization would be undermined and perhaps life exterminated throughout the galaxy. Astronomical knowledge provided no clue whatever to the problem. The theory of stellar evolution had seemed perfect, but it had no place for these singular events. Meanwhile, the Society of Worlds had set about the task of artificially exploding all stars that had not yet spontaneously passed through the Nova phase. It was hoped thus to render them comparatively safe, and then to use them once more as suns. But now that all kinds of stars had become equally dangerous, this work was abandoned. Instead, Arrangements were made to procure the radiation necessary to life from the stars that had ceased to shine. Controlled disintegration of their atoms would turn them into satisfactory suns, at least for a while. Unfortunately, the epidemic of fiery plumes was increasing rapidly. System by system, the living worlds were being swept out of existence. Desperate research hit at last on a method of diverting the fiery tentacle away from the plane of the ecliptic. This process was far from reliable. Moreover, if it succeeded, the sun would sooner or later project another filament. The state of the galaxy was being very rapidly changed. Hitherto, there had been an incalculable wealth of stellar energy. But this energy was now being shed, like rain from a thundercloud. Though a single explosion did not seriously affect the vigor of a star, repetitions became more exhausting as they increased in number. Many young stars had been reduced to decrepitude. The great majority of the stellar population had now passed their prime. Multitudes were mere glowing coals or lightless ash. The minded worlds, also, were much reduced in number, for in spite of all ingenious measures of defense, causality casualties were still heavy. I don't know why I keep wanting to say causalities. That is not the word. <laughs> this reduction of the population of the worlds was the more serious because in its prime the galactic society of worlds had been so highly organized. In some ways, it was less like a society than a brain. The disaster had almost blotted out certain higher brain centers and greatly reduced the vitality of all. It had also seriously impaired telepathic intercourse between the systems of worlds by forcing each system to concentrate on its own urgent physical problem of defense against the attacks of its own sun. The communal mind of the Society of Worlds now ceased to operate. The emotional attitude of the world has also changed. The fervor of the establishment of cosmical utopia had vanished, and with it, the fervor for the completion of the spirit's adventure by the fulfillment of knowledge and creative capacity. Now that extermination seemed inevitable within a comparatively short time, there was an increasing will to meet fate with religious peace. The desire to realize the far cosmical goal, formerly the supreme motive of all awakened worlds, now seemed to be extravagant, 
even impious. How should the little creatures, the awakened worlds, reach out to knowledge of the whole cosmos and of the divine? Instead, they must play their own part in the drama and appreciate their own tragic end with godlike attachment and relish. This mood of exultant re resignation, appropriate to unavoidable disaster, quickly changed under the influence of a new discovery. In certain quarters there had, been, there had long been a suspicion that the irregular activity of the stars was not merely automatic, but purposeful. In fact, that the stars were alive and were striving to rid themselves of the pests of planets. I love that the life cycle on each of the planets is now being mirrored with the stars. That's great. I love it. This possibility had at first seemed too fantastic but it gradually became obvious that the destruction of a star's planetary system was the end which determined the duration of the irregular action. Of course, it was possible that in some unexplained but purely mechanical way, the presence of many planetary girdles created the explosion, or the fiery limb. Astronomical physics could suggest no mechanism, whatever, which could have this result. Telepathic research was now undertaken in order to test the theory of stellar consciousness, and if possible, to set up communication with the minded stars. This venture was at first completely barren. The worlds had not the slightest knowledge of the right method of approach to mind which, if they existed at all, must be inconceivably different from their own. It seemed all too probable that no factors in the mentality of minded worlds were sufficiently akin to the stellar mentality to form a means of contact. Though the worlds used their imaginative powers as best they might, though they explored, so to speak, every subterranean passage and gallery of their own mentality, tapping everywhere in the hope of answer, they received none. The theory of stellar purpose purposefulness began to seem incredible. Once more the worlds began to turn to the consolation, nay, the joy of acceptance. Nevertheless, a few world systems that had specialized in psychological techniques persisted in their researches, confident that, if only they could communicate with the stars, some kind of mutual understanding and concord could be brought out brought about between the two great orders of minds in the galaxy. At long last, the desired contact with the stellar minds was effected. It came not through the unaided efforts of the minded worlds of our galaxy, but partly through the med mediation of another galaxy, where already the worlds and the stars had begun to realize one another. Even to the minds of fully awakened worlds, the stellar mentality was almost too alien to be conceived at all. To me, the little human individual, all that is most distinctive in it is now quite incomprehensible. Nevertheless, its simpler aspect I must now try to summarize as best I may, since it is essential to my story. The minded worlds made their first contact with the stars on the higher planes of stellar experience, but I shall not follow the chronological order of their discoveries. Instead, I shall begin with aspects of the stellar nature which were haltingly inferred only after intercourse of a, of a sort had become fairly well established. It is in terms of stellar biology and physiology that the reader may most easily conceive something of the mental life of stars. That is the end of part two of chapter 11. And I think that's going to be where we stop today. We are 74% of the way through, so we will definitely be finishing next time. <laughs> We'll see how long that actually takes. Also, I feel like had I known at the beginning of this book 
how many times specific words are said. I feel like it could have been a drinking game. <laughs> like, how many times have we said pervert? Or what else? Um, intercourse? Or I don't even know. Telepathy? Like, we've, we've said them all the time. They're rampant. They're running rampant in this book. <laughs> Yeah, intercourse. Like, so much. So many times. I have never said intercourse more times in my life than reading this book. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it. To be frank. To be moog. <laughs> but yeah. That's gonna be it for today. Oh, big stretch. Big stretch. We will definitely be finishing next time so that's exciting oh huh. but yeah i hope you all have a great rest of your night but as always whether you lurk whether you chat i one thousand percent appreciate you and i one thousand percent appreciate the support overwhelming support today thank you all so so much excellent if i don't see you next time. I hope to see you even sooner. Have a good one. Bye!